Welcome, geeks, to another episode of Rockin' the Code World with Donna Dave. I'm David McCarter, and uh, I'm glad you're all here today. Um, uh, today, the, today is show number 34, August 21st, and, and my guest today is Chris Fossey from OverOps, a principal software uh, solution engineer. So I'm in interested to talk about him because we had you know one of his cohorts on the uh, uh, the uh, code quality conference that we're over seventy eight thousand views now. So um, it'd be uh, and then next week we have somebody else from his company. So we're I, I guess my show's being uh, taken over by uh, OverOps um, these days. Uh, that's good. Uh, anyway, um, you know, let's start off the show. Uh, I think of goofy things to show you guys, and 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 I know this the show is uh, you know shown throughout the world, and you might not have things like we do here in America, but um, I think I mentioned on my show a long uh, quite a while ago that you know I really miss my friends in India, and um, you know I, I was really sad I couldn't come out this year and uh, and last year to uh, uh, see you all and hang out with you and 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 speak and speak uh, you know at the C Sharp Corner Conference and and have Indian food, which I love. And uh, so uh, so something I found recent, um, probably late last year, early this year, is that, you know, this is my this is my Alexa device right here that's in my living room. This is the uh, the uh, Echo Studio. And, um, and so since I miss, you know, I miss all my friends in India, I found out that, you know, there's actually a Indian accent and uh, you can set up for your Alexa device. I've, I've tried some of the other accents, like Australian. I don't like them very much, and uh, I forget what else. But you know, I've kind of left it on the Indian um, accent because um, it, it, you know, it reminds me of you every day, and uh, and that I miss you, and I can't wait to see you again. But you know, I I have to say that the Indian accent on Alexa, if you haven't tried it, is the nicest accent there is. Now I'll show you what I mean. Because uh, usually, you know, when you talk to Alexa, um, here, let me turn her off. Um, you know, usually when you talk to Alexa, you know, she just, you know, gives you the answer and she's very straight and to the, to the point. But the Indian accent uh, seems to be a little nicer and kinder. And, uh, you know, I appreciate that. So I'm going to give you an example. But um, I want you to listen to the end of the example because I, at the end, I'm going to ask Alexa what the weather is. And then at the end, I'm going to say thank you. And then I want you to, to to pay attention to what she says after I say thank you, because that's the big difference with the different uh, uh, different accents that I've tried on Alexa. Is her thank yous are just really awesome. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask her the the weather now, and then like I said, say thank you at the end. Alexa, weather. Currently in San Diego, it's 66 degrees Fahrenheit with cloudy skies. You can expect more of the same today with a high of 73 degrees and a low of 64 degrees. Thank you. With a smile on my voice and a ring that's blue, I'm always here for you. <laughs> Isn't that cool? You know, the, the other accents don't do that. And so, um, sorry, sorry, I'm off screen. I'm unplugging her so I don't. Uh, waste any uh, bandwidth, uh, but I don't know about you, but I think uh, I think she's got the coolest accent and and the coolest comebacks when you say thank you and and things like that to her. So if you if you have an Alexa and you haven't tried the Indian, Indian accent, uh, check it out. It's like I said, I I find it the most comforting, nicest um, accent uh, uh, that Amazon has. I mean, the Alexa has anyway. So. I don't know if you can hear it, but they're still doing construction on the on the unit under me. So if you hear some sawing and banging and stuff, I apologize for that. I don't have a lot of control over it. You know, I do want to talk um, again about the uh, my challenge uh, to all software developers out there uh, to donate a hundred dollars to the the relief uh, fund that we're doing in India to help the families and the people dealing with um, with COVID nineteen. You know. Um, you know, COVID is uh, is is the COVID nineteen uh, Delta variant is getting really bad in America right now. There's a lot of hospitals, uh, mostly in the south uh, part of the country, that are absolutely out of um, ICU beds and out of beds completely, especially for children. And we're seeing a lot more children going into the hospital uh, with the Delta variant. 
Uh, but um, as bad as it is in, in America, just imagine how bad it is in India. So they still really need to support. Uh, they are getting more vaccine, which is good. I talked to Simon before the show today. Uh, so I'm happy they're getting some more vaccine, but you know, they India has a lot of challenges that uh, we certainly don't have here. So I hope you all will take a minute after the show and donate at least $100 or more to match my donation um, to this fund here. And um, if you do, please uh, tweet that you donated. And if you live in the US, I'll send you some swag and maybe even a book. How about that? I've got lots of uh, stuff I'm trying to get out of my house. My son and my daughter-in-law are coming to visit in a couple of weeks and I'm trying to get this stuff out of my house. So um, anyway, I hope you go uh, uh, donate uh, to to this fund or just try to try to help out, um, you know, another country or somebody else in need uh, during this crisis, because uh, hopefully we can all uh, get through it together. Um, I found out yesterday that two of my grandchildren might have been exposed to COVID and I'm waiting to hear back uh, right now from that. And uh, so I'm waiting any minute. My daughter will uh, text me and let me all know how they're doing. I'm a bit worried about my eldest uh, granddaughter uh, because she's got um, asthma and we all know that, you know, makes COVID uh, uh, much worse. So keeping my fingers crossed, my kids don't have, uh, my grandkids don't have COVID. And uh, so they'll stay healthy. They started school last week. And so I want them to enjoy school and, and uh, have all that fun. Anyway, okay. I want to uh, plug the um, Azure Summit uh, coming to September 13th through the 19th. Uh, right now, there's 50,000 people registered for this 10-day summit. Uh, uh, and there's 135 speakers, Simon just told me. So uh, this is really going to be fun. I'm going to be doing some stuff with the conference. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this. I don't know how I'll ever watch all of it, but uh, I definitely will be uh, joining as, as much as I can and uh, making my comments and then uh, whatever else I do with the conference. So um, if you haven't registered, please go register and uh, and and make sure to uh, block out that week uh, uh, to watch the Azure Summit. Uh, I think this will be the largest virtual conference I've ever heard about at least. So uh, I feel sorry for Simon, but I, I think it's gonna be great. Um, I want to plug again, I made a new graphic because I was kind of bored this week. Um, I made a new graphic uh, to get support for uh, the Hello World cookbook. So um, this is my latest um, uh, a drive to raise money for the Voice of Slum NGO in Delhi, India. Uh, they've been doing a lot of work, um, especially during the COVID time to not only feed the, uh, the kids from the slums in, El in, in, in Delhi, India, but also uh, uh, people in Delhi, India, because of the COVID um, crisis. So uh, if you cook or if someone in your family cooks, please submit your recipe as soon as possible. Uh, I need to get them done. I need to get them submitted all by October. And uh, if you don't cook, uh, you can still help out. You can help me test the recipes because I can't eat them all because I eat gluten free. You can also help with um, editing because uh, I, I, I'm terrible at English and and you can help with the graphic artists because I'm not great at graphic artists, <laughs> artists either. So, um, and Mahesh just said, uh, writing recipes is harder than writing articles. <laughs> yeah, you know how many years I've been working on some of these recipes that are gonna be in the book? Uh, years, uh, so yeah. Um, so if you haven't submitted, please go to Hello World Cookbook. And if you know somebody in the tech industry that loves to cook, uh, please uh, please send them the link and get them to submit a recipe as soon as possible. Okay, thanks. And 100% and of the proceeds of this book uh, and merchandising or whatever wacky other things I do will all go to the Voice of Slum in India. This is, uh, you know, uh, this is a uh, um, pet project of mine because I really love helping people, especially uh, my friends in India. So uh, please help out, thanks. Um, and with that, I think it's time to introduce my guest today. So Chris Avasi has been the technology leader for the past couple of decades, leading in the latest and greatest new technologies. He's helped pioneer things like Windows and .NET development, client server, web, Java, mobile, and now uh, DevOps to find uh, uh, why our applications break. <laughs> I have a lot of comments about that. Uh, there uh, <laughs> there's likely isn't a role he hasn't done 
as he helped many companies begin and excel their journeys in, into these technologies. So welcome, Chris. Hey, good morning and good evening for those that are listening live. Uh, how, how are you doing? Good, good. Just uh, waiting for the sun, sun to poke up here at a little further nor north of you in uh, Redondo Beach, California. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's where you live. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if I'm going to see the sun today. We'll see. Um, Fingers I, I, crossed. Yeah, I don't think I don't think it came out yesterday, but maybe today. But I, I don't know. It's not looking good. <laughs> not by by the ocean, you know, inland. It's probably already sunny. But oh, yeah, you know, three blocks yeah. away. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> that's 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 kind of what gets me in trouble sometimes when I I, I, ride, I go ride my bike. You know, I, I look outside. I go, oh, it's it's overcast. No problem. I don't, I don't need sunscreen or anything. And then, bam, one mile. It's bright, sunny, you know, burning my skin off. <laughs> one mile or one minute. It all mm -hmm. depends. Yeah. Um, um, oh, Mahesh likes your uh, professional radio uh, host. It's, it's crisp and clean voice. He likes your voice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you do have that kind of like radio DJ kind of uh Kind of voice we'll keep it up and it, and once i get to the out and about you'll figure out the canadian accent on there too yeah <laughs> not that we have djs anymore really but you know and back in the day you know Mem remember the days when M mtv actually played vi music <laughs> i i actually do and didn't we just have the big anniversary of that uh yeah. the last couple of weeks <laughs> yeah Happy anniversary, MTV. You don't play music anymore. <laughs> I actually said to somebody the other day, they said, oh, yeah, I was listening to the radio. And I'm like, what's a radio? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you know, um, yeah, I always had a dream that, you know, if I was rich, if I was rich as Bill Gates or um, uh, Steve Jobs or something like that, I, I would buy those channels and put them back the way they were. You know, I turned MTV back into a video and because I used to, you know, I still remember uh, watching really great concerts from like Iron Maiden and Judas Priest and, you know, bands like that in the beginning of, uh, you know, uh, MTV. And now it's just trash. You know, it's been that way for 20 years, pretty much. Yeah. No, they got yeah. away around. The, you actually understood what the songs were about. Because <laughs> of the fact we could watch the videos. And, and don't you remember the premieres of those videos? Yeah. Jump on and, oh, tonight, everybody watch. Uh, the new song from Michael Jackson is coming. Yeah, out. You're all yeah. checking it out or or Ozzy Osbourne or whatever. And this, oh, that's what that referred to. Or yeah. <laughs> And now it's just like some bands make videos and I go, what for? You know, <laughs> for YouTube. But, you know, they're not being played on TV or anything. That's for sure. Um, I'm convinced it's product promotions. That's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But most, uh, uh, I don't want to get into the subject, but, you know, most popular music sucks anyway so um <laughs> I, i'm convinced nothing came out since the 80s um, yeah that's my life yeah it's, well some some good music has come out but especially the stuff i hear on the radio or you know on these music awards shows and stuff is just go oh my gosh you know what's happened you know yeah. and don't you remember your parents saying the same to you yeah but i i, I think about that and you know it you know, back in my day, it was oh, you listen to devil's music and stuff like that. But <laughs> you know, it's um, you know, Ozzy Osbourne's, you know, the part of the devil, and you know, you have to listen to his records backwards and crap like that. You know, but you know that that's all publicity and marketing, and you know, it's. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, I do think about you know music back in the '60s, '70s. You know that you know they were really artists back then and they were really started genres and and uh you know they actually played their own mu instruments and you know and they actually wrote their own songs and you know this doesn't happen much anymore right you and, know? and doesn't that now it touches the software world realistically because yeah. we can get down to bit level changes on the songs and, and correct anything yeah yeah, and I no, we don't like that as a C sharp. Let's make it a you know, just a C flat, and yeah, you can yeah. do that in a song programmatically. No, well, I can do that with my uh, Adobe Edition. Yeah, I can I can do that with Adobe Edition. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and, and maybe my voice is actually synthesized right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I just love you know talking to younger people, and 
they say, well, you know, those, uh, what was those Korean K-pop crap, you know, and, uh, oh, they're great singers. I go, they can't sing. Are you kidding me? You know, they, 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 let me see them sing a cappello, And then with, with no, with no equipment, just them and a, and a, in a phone and, and let's see. Right. And so see if they can really sing, right? Yeah, well, and, Pentatonix uh, is isn't that the group? Pentatonix. Yeah, they're they they're a lot. Of, uh, yeah, uh, they do. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, yeah, let's see if they can sing without all that equipment and all that software, and see how they sound. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we're we're going way off the uh, tangent here. So, um, well, I've already mentioned .NET and bit level changes. So, did we go that far? Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Simon's laughing at BTS. Yeah, that's, I can't listen to BTS. Sorry. Um, I don't even know what that stands for. They're just trashy shit. Oops. Sorry, Simon. <laughs> I, cussed on, I cussed on YouTube. <laughs> They're going to take us down. Um, uh, so anyway, it, so any, <laughs> sorry, I'm a little bit under the weather. I'm, I'm a little uh, um, scattered brain today. So, um, you know, we we did put up two um, a, a couple of topics to talk about today: developing apps for the enterprise and startups, and then also one about um, software development lifecycle, which I'm really big into. And uh, so, those of you, or and we can talk about anything else. We can keep talking about crappy pop music if you want to. Um, so please make a comment in the uh, in the comments and 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 let us know what you want to talk about and, and any questions you want to ask Chris uh, since he's here uh, and. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about uh, developing apps for the enterprise and startups because that's those that that's a, like a big, completely different thing. You know, developing really apps is. for a startup and developing apps for an enterprise is completely different, pretty much. Absolutely, yeah, it really is. It, if we look at a startup, you're trying to get to your MVP, um, your uh, most viable product that you can get out there on the market and hit it and start to make some money off of it. Well, yeah. in the enterprise, you're looking at more of a, a long-term strategy, reusable, and can be shared throughout the enterprise. And and definitely, the very different disciplines. I've been part of both of those for years. I've been a lot of the time on the software provider side in the back end. I remember back in the day, um, Power Builder days. Hmm. Uh, I actually worked at PowerSoft. Uh, if you if you followed that side, so after mm -hmm. actually I did a lot of Visual Basic, the original Visual Basic programming. Yep. So. But yeah, as as you know, we hit the startup side. Um, you know, you're you're trying to churn code really fast. You're trying to get it out, and it's got to be right. It's got to be you know that viable product that somebody can start to use. And I was, in fact, I was writing. Yes, writing, helping uh, my team that uh, that I developed throughout the world. I actually had a couple of folks in India, down in um, Argentina, and and various places, and we were trying to put together a product for an IoT device. And uh, the back end of it, it was just crazy how much we had to do. Hmm. And, you know, the one thing that I'd say is in common with both enterprise and startups is when you have a problem mm -hmm. and it can grind you to a halt. Like we yes. went from one day excelling, almost getting every feature to a bug, mm -hmm. all hands on deck. And, yeah. and we were all trying to figure this thing out. And I, you know, I remember the day well because I actually had to uh, jump on a plane to North Carolina just because we couldn't do it. Six of us working on this around the clock mm -hmm. and commenting code and throwing things in there. Like, this shouldn't be happening. Damn, it is. And then <laughs> this definitely shouldn't be happening. And then it gets into a whole lot, lot of other colorful words that you, we can't say on YouTube. Um, but it, it just got frustrating debugging it. And, um, you know, j just to jump and, you know, the brief side on OverOps, it, that's where I, when I came into OverOps, I had an immediate appreciation because we were able to get in and find these things quicker. And we can talk yeah. about that later. But that's where I see the biggest thing is when, when you have that bug, but it's an all hands on deck. You know, mm -hmm. whether it's if it's a startup, you're all looking at it. If you're in an enterprise, it's war room time. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, I, I know people that follow me know that I'm really big on coding standards and things like that. And, and uh, you know, I really pound that into people's heads all the time. And and every once in a while, you know, I'll some, have someone come up to me and say, well, I work for a startup and do I have to do that? And I go, well, yeah, I mean, startups are a bit different. I always, I always, I always say it's like, uh, you know, you're coding with, uh, 
you know, with your with your pants on fire, right? Because you're trying to get that out so you can, you know, get to the next round of investments and or whatever else, you know, to keep the company afloat. But when you're at an enterprise, it's much different. You're you're talking longevity. Longevity. Mm -hmm. You need to make sure that you're uh, creating apps that are. Um, um, easy to change and easy to you know, fix bugs and things like that. And and from what I've seen, you know, and even currently is that, you know, there there's there's a point where you kind of have to say, okay, we have to move out of the startup mode and get into the enterprise mode. And so, so how do we do that? You know, I think too many people just take that startup code and just keep piling stuff on it until it's a huge mess oh. and then and then you and then it just basically gets to a point where it all freezes basically right mm -hmm. and and nothing can happen right and i see that too it's about and, a year uh, transition i've noticed i've actually yeah. uh, worked with a, a few companies over the past couple of years while i've been here at overops and they were a startup and uh, then they got bought by the the big company in their space mm -hmm. and they they last for a little while until everybody starts getting emerged and then it's about a year process from start to finish to get integrated yeah yeah because it, it's a much different environment you and, and and usually you have a lot more players you know you have a lot more teams you know when you work for a startup there might be only one team you and a few other people right i've, I've worked at five person six person startups right there's you yeah know, you wear a lot of hats in those things right but when you get to a bigger team it's becomes a much more complex in it and uh and and but you can't keep thinking like you're a startup, right? Oh yeah. You, well, you just can't keep slopping code in there and thinking that it's going to be okay and 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 last the next five or ten years, right? Oh, absolutely. And you look at just your scrums and your your agile process in general. It's drastically different when you start yeah. off and you're you're it's a couple of you on a call, maybe a Zoom <laughs> call or a Skype or whatever, and you're trying to put all this together. And then you get into that enterprise and you've got to count on a lot of different groups and. One of the biggest things I see change from startup to enterprise is going to what you were saying about the SDLC, yeah, right? Yeah. You start getting into a lot more automation of the tests. Mm -hmm. And and I'd say that that's a trend right now. I think everybody's embarrassed to tell me that they, um, they don't have enough coverage on those <laughs> tests. And I break the news to them. You are in the more popular place. About 80% of the companies I probably see don't have enough coverage today and they're trying no. to get there it's it's a goal yeah and it's i don't even know if we'll ever get there but it gets better every day and you have to have a place to start and, and begin the journey and eventually you'll get to a new place and then there'll be a moving line but yeah, yeah. that's you know that's one of those critical parts the more things you can get tested and also feed back into the test routines mm -hmm. the better right because you want right. to discover your issues and and we say and here's another interesting uh difference if if, if people haven't thought about it in the uh startup world when something goes wrong it's usually kind of minor mm -hmm. uh it, it may be don't get me wrong it may be more important and even more important to you but um it, it it's completely different when it get different when it gets into the enterprise world where mm -hmm. that is impacting a, a lot more people and we often see and look at this like that the life cycle as the the sdlc is if you can go and get things done and fixed and have reasonable code getting into production it's a lot cheaper than fixing it after it goes into production oh yeah yeah. You know, it's a sliding scale. It's it, yeah. it it's very logarithmic actually. It keeps going up, and you start to see like it may cost a uh, hundred dollars to fix it in pre production, it may cost right. you twenty dollars to fix in you know on the developer's desktop if you could do it right. But once it gets into production, you're talking thousands probably. Yeah, yeah. And and in one of my conference talks, I actually have a chart. You know, this study done by this really smart guy who who basically laid it all out on basically how 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 much times it costs you know so if you if you find a bug like during a, a requirements phase right there's no cost in that by the time it gets to uh coding you're already 10 times the cost yeah then then if you found it in the beginning and then if a user finds it or gets into production right it's over 100 times the cost than if you fixed it correctly in the beginning right and because if, if you really think about it you know, if I find it, it's usually pretty quick and simple and, and you know, that's it. But when a user finds it, just to think of all the channels that has to go through before it even arrives to you, right? 
and then you make the fix and then you have to go through the whole testing cycle all over again and get it into production right. and well yeah, it's <laughs> and one thing i often say is it takes about 15 people to experience the problem before one of them reports it yeah that's yeah. the worst part we don't even know it happens a lot of times yeah right? and, and and absolutely and and what happens like a year five years later down the line the code's sitting out there in the wild running and that 15 per, 15th person finally reports it oh but uh you know joe the programmer uh has already left your company yep for that yeah. part how do you figure that part out and that's and that's, that's a whole nother can of worms because you know yeah. i don't think there's even the teams i work in you know the teams i work in are just as guilty that we don't have enough cross um uh, uh, training or knowledge transfer, right? Because, right. you know, e even in the last team I worked for, you know, if someone went on vacation, you know, this stuff didn't happen, you know, until they got back from vacation. And that's, <laughs> you can't run a company like that. No. You know? No. And Yeah. I um, see a couple of good questions on here. Yeah. So let me, let me go back a little bit. So uh, Simon said that uh, our show has been banned in South Korea. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I laughed earlier. I saw that comment come in. <laughs> and he says, uh, how often uh, you see startups using .NET equals, uh, Echo's ecosystem? Uh, usually it's JavaScript. Yeah, that's true. Um, startups yeah. the freelancers. Yeah. A lot of what I find in the um, a lot of startups, they try to be a little more agile. Mm -hmm. They'll go with a lot less structure of things and go into more emerging technologies. Like if you look at yeah. Um, the, the, the latest, uh, some of the latest stuff coming into .NET now and th some of the things like Node, um, mm -hmm. uh, Sencha and, uh, and all those other JavaScript based tool, um, languages. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as they, they have that ability to turn when mm -hmm. an enterprise, um, really can't, they, they have to have standardization and they yeah. look at everything from a, Hey, this has got to be a five to 10 year life. Hmm. And we don't know where these things uh, re react. Where you know wh when is it going to, you know, get introduced or a new version will come out because we've seen this happen, you know, year over year. Oh yeah. What's yeah. the hot language of the day? Yeah, yeah. And 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 Simon, in, in early .NET, there were a lot of startups that used .NET. You mm -hmm. know, I do, I remember the early two thousands, and there were a lot of startups. I worked for some of them. You know, yeah. but I think that's kind of kind of like what you were just saying. That's kind of shifted a bit to the the more emerging technologies because, but you know, twenty years ago, .NET was an emerging technology, right? Right. And, it's it's yeah. trendy, like like Korean pop. Yeah. Right? <laughs> hey, look at that! We can tie it all back. Yeah. You know, it is the the trends do change over time, and but when it gets to the enterprise level, uh, or as we get older, we tend to go back to our uh, basics and roots. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Um, Let's see. Uh, how do you uh, convince uh, startups to pay your enterprise rates fees? That's yeah. a great question. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. How do we, no. <laughs> how do we do that? <laughs> um, it, it really, it, you have to look. You have to look for those startups that uh, often I think they're giving you different options of equity and, uh, and pay. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a little bit of a long-term payoff uh, because they are either, you know, underfunded, not funded, or just you know, just getting in there, trying to make sure everything goes. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's your track record. You know, I, I would yeah. argue, and if I looked at a developer that was really going to be a rock star for me, uh, I'd be bringing them in uh, at a reasonable conversion. Uh, but then a little bit maybe of equity is often what happens at the uh, startups that you can't do on the enterprise. Yeah, that's true. Um, and, you know, and I, I've said this a lot, I don't say it en enough anymore that, you know, um, those beginners out there, um, depending where you live in the, in the world, of course, but, you know, if you want to learn a lot of experience quickly, then go find some startups, right? And and that's what made me learn a lot quickly in the beginning, mm -hmm. because, you know, back in the, you know, you know, I was part of the internet bubble days, right? And, uh, and, uh, and back then, you know, everybody was trying to jump on a startup to, you know, make it big, right? Make a ton of money. Um, and that's why I did that was because I wanted to cash out and make a lot of money, be retired at 40. But, you know, that certainly didn't happen. But but uh, but the good thing that that decision did was make me learn a lot and make me learn a lot uh, wear a lot of hats. And, and a lot of the things I learned, you know, in those startups, I still use today. Right. And um, so I was I'm 
looking back, I'm, I'm appreciative. You know, I, I didn't make it big. I didn't retire at 40, or, you know, like I wanted to. But, you know, it, it was a great learning experience for me to work for a startup. Yeah, I, I wouldn't work for a startup now. But um, back then, it was a great learning experience for me, at least. Yeah, yeah I, I personally, I love that environment. I love the wearing the every hat, mm -hmm. you know. And that's one thing you have to realize when you're going in there. You know, all opinions are, are valued. They may not be the one that's right. Right. Um, but that it's, you just have to be willing to survive through a bit of it. It can be some hardships, uh, getting through because you're, you're trying to build something up and yeah. some sacrifice in the short term is, you know, reward in the long term. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and, and thinking back to the startups, I, I think I felt I was more part of the process in startups, right? Because absolutely. Yeah. In the startup, especially if you, if you join the startup right at the beginning, right. And you release your first product and usually have a big party and, you know, celebration and, and you feel really good, you know, that, Hey, we released something with just five people and this is great. And, but, you know, when you go to a big company, you know, release something, everybody goes, Hey, okay, what's uh, what, you know, let's get working on the next stuff tomorrow. You know, it's, yeah. it's no, it's, it's no big deal. You don't, it's, you just feel you're kind of a smaller, a small wheel in a big, a big thing. I think, you know, I mean, I mean, both can be rewarding, but I, I think startups as far as releasing the product seems a bit more rewarding to me, at least. I, I don't know right. about you. Yeah. No, I, absolutely. I, I, that's the part I like to see and, and the rewarding, rewarding time. It takes, it takes a couple of years typically. You know, yeah. it's not nothing is going to be fast. There's a lot of things yeah. to build up, but I, I would definitely see you see bigger reward on that side. And yeah. Um, yeah, and I see another question. I'm going to go skip the the next one if you don't mind, and we'll come back up to it. But you yeah, know, how do startups get uh, funding? Yeah, funding. Yeah, yeah, because I think that that's a really good uh, point there. Because you know, it, it really all depends. A lot of them start with friends and family. Mm -hmm. um, you know, who, you know, then you start going out there and you start, you know, showing that MVP, um, the my, most viable product to folks and start to get that funding. And then you start to get into that other side, but just, you know, one thing a lot of people don't see on the side of startups is you have to give something away in order to, you know, get that money from the bigger funders, mm -hmm. right? You may yeah. find you've got some really good friends that can help you and, and support you, but you might get your first hundred thousand that way or so. But once you start talking those bigger numbers, um, you're going to give away a bit of the company. In fact, yeah. you may give away half the company, you know, as it's looking right there. Yeah, and, and it's not and, an easy process. No, and 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 usually the the uh, you know the people who donate or or give money to the startup, you know, usually are preferred stock, right? Whereas you know, and, and a lot of people have to re remember that, that, yeah, you have stock, but you have to remember there's probably people that have preferred stock that in, you know, in front of you. And uh, so make sure you think about that when you're, you're joining a company, right? Right. Uh, you know, and, it, it, and even that you're going to now have a board of directors with them. Yeah. Most likely they are going to want a participation and it may not be in line with your goals or the founder's goals, uh, depending if you're one of them or not. Yeah. Um, eventually, maybe day one it is, but I could change. So, you know, yeah. it, but it's still, it's a lot of fun, right? And it, it can is. be, like you said, rewarding down the line. Yeah. It, it, and I'm glad I was younger when I did that. You know, like I said, I don't think I could do it now, but uh, uh, especially when I was younger, yeah, I really enjoyed it. And uh, and uh, even, you know, I, I live where I do because I used to work like three blocks away from me, you know, and that's, you know, uh, well, I, I live here, you know, even even right. now I never left because, you know, once you live by the beach, it's kind of hard to move away, right? <laughs> no, definitely. definitely. We'll, we'll deal. We like these cloudy days. They're kind of like our rain days. And yeah. They, they don't really happen that often. <laughs> no. And and that, and that way I, I don't need air conditioning and all that stuff, you know. But uh, this is true. What is yeah. it? thing at the beach? Yeah. <laughs> it's called open your window. <laughs> open your window. Exactly. That's, that's what it is. But we had, we had that other question on their QA. I don't want to make, uh, since I skipped it, I was going to bring us back there. And yeah, um, yeah the, the QA, QA process. Yeah. <laughs> QA process, absolutely, right? And whenever you're, you know, there's some great products out there, Jenkins and Spinnaker and, and all these that can actually go and take you through that CI pipeline, essentially, and, and do the, K, uh, the QA process. That's your goal, is to find all those errors, right? Let's go back to that part mm -hmm. that we were talking about. And 
you know, if, if you can catch them early enough, it's going to cost you less. Like, like you said, Dave, it's just, yeah. it really is uh, magnitudes uh, less expensive to catch these things early and, you know, and point out where it is. Yeah. And that's, and that's one thing you know, I drill in, you know, like even, you know, two days, two nights ago, I was speaking at a user group in, um, in, in Michigan and, um, and, uh, you know, that's, now I forgot where I was going with that. QA. Uh, nah, I lost my train of thought. QA, Bitcoin, CICD. Yeah. Um, um, uh, well, you'll remember it. Yeah, it'll, it'll come back to me. It's, <laughs> but uh, yeah, QA is super important, and and uh, and and not only QA, but real good QA. You know, mm -hmm. and and good QA teams and people. You know, to me, it's it's. To me, it's um, finding a good, good QA pe person is like finding a really good bass player, right? <laughs> they exist, but they're really hard to find, you know? <laughs> you I can put you in touch with a few. Huh? I can put you in touch with a few. Yeah. Bass players and, and QA both, actually. Yeah. Because QA people are sometimes a lot pretty transient because they're just there, you know, they're there so they can be a software engineer maybe in somewhere else in the company or they're, they want to be a PM or something like that. But... Yeah, finding a really good QA person, especially one that's really um, hot on automation, is worth every penny if you can find one well, that will. Yeah. Well, and it's you know they're they're they are kind of the backbone of of getting the quality product out there because they have to be somebody that thinks out of the box. I, I yeah. agree with you on this, right? And and they find things that nobody else can, and and that's where I know when I've stepped in uh, myself, and I'm thinking of a, an old colleague uh, in, in uh, North Carolina too that work together and we used to tell our developers you know you've got to test your code because mm -hmm. if you don't guess who's going to find it todd mm -hmm. and i, todd yeah, and I yeah. will find that silliest little thing but we will also find it before the first person within probably 10 minutes of using the product will yeah and yeah. can't say we have complete coverage on that but it, it happened every time and that's where i go for all, all those uh, developers that are just uh, hardcore in the development side and want to stay in there it's really important to test this stuff because it does mm -hmm. cost us a lot more. Uh, and it's frustrating, right? It, mm -hmm. it's, it's really frustrating. And, you know, there's nothing worse than, you know, getting that whenever a bug comes in, what, what's the famous thing that happened? Somebody reports a bug. You as a developer starts to look at it and go, I can't reproduce that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it's probably, I, I think we just need a soundboard or that easy yeah. button from <laughs> Staples years ago. You know, I, I can't reproduce it. Yeah. And that's what's stalled people back. Um, yeah. So a lot of times, and, and a QA person will always, the beautiful part, and, and this is something I think if people forget, a QA person not only can find them, but they know exactly. They're tracking the steps they got to get there to document it. Right, right. And that's an art. Yeah. That really is. Yeah, yeah. We... I, you know, it, for some reason, this made me remember of you know the, my last job. Now that I don't work there, I can talk more about them. Uh, but you know, I, I remember you know that that I architected and, and delivered what they said was the best run project in the company's history. And 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 I remember you know before we released it, and you know, unfortunately, like a lot of big you know enterprise companies, is QA didn't really come on board until the very end, which I think is a complete mistake. Right. Mm -hmm. QA should be there in the beginning, but most companies, it doesn't work that way. And so by the time we, you know, got QA involved in our, in our, in the product, they were literally asking us if we QA it. And I'm going, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, re I remember days like that too. I've been what, part of the same. What are you talking about? Aren't you QA? You know, and, and they were asking us if they should sign off on it. I'm going, <laughs> what planet do you live on? <laughs> and then, That's so then true. we released it and and immediately there were issues so we we knew as a as a development team that they didn't even test it right because right. we found you know simple like text box issues right that should have been found by somebody else that's not the developer right yeah and and oh. that's the big thing is a lot of people go oh well, developers can qa no wrong developers are the last people that should be testing the, the testing the app right yeah. they are developers uh yeah, we do the I unit totally testing, agree. but we don't do the testing, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I actually, there's a difference in um, in enterprise versus startup, right? In enterprise, the a test driven development um, site type of mentality can work well. 
Mm -hmm. Not quite the same. I think it's overboard in a startup environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it sure. just you don't have because the time it takes to document that is you could have already written it and then fixed it three times probably. Yeah, yeah, and that's maybe exaggerating a little bit there, but yeah, yeah, yeah. And no, that's man. and that's and that's one thing you know. If, if people follow me on um, on on Twitter and stuff, that I'm always complaining about Visual Studio because you know I don't think they do a good enough job to make. Uh, some things um, easy for us, and 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 writing unit tests is one of them, right? I've been on them for years now because, you know, they they used to have a really good framework for for writing unit tests, you know. Because I should back up a little bit. I've told this story a bunch of times, but you know, I I remember being when I used to run the user group. The user group used to be two blocks from where I live. Like I could walk there. If I everything wanted. is in with three blocks. It sounds like there. Well, when I yeah. run it, then then everything's by me, right? <laughs> but um, um, but where was it going with that? Uh, Visual Studio with the uh, oh yeah, uh, and so, just, uh, so when when unit testing started becoming more popular. Um, Every, you know, I would get questions all the time. And I still remember the one guy at the user group asking me this. He goes, well, we have all this legacy code. What do I do, Dave? And I go, well, <laughs> there's a lots of, lots, a lot of work, you know? And I would say definitely do unit tests on new stuff and then get to the, get to the old stuff when you can. And then, you know, I, because of some of those kind of comments, I worked, you know, closely with um, this project manager at Microsoft for two years uh, when they were developing um, IntelliTests that were in Visual Studio. A stupid name, but a great, great framework, right? And and, and what IntelliTests did was basically, you know, looked at all the code paths, basically your cyclomatic complexity, you know, in a nutshell, and try to break your method, right? And then it would basically spit out unit tests to test that, right? And all you had to do was write a little bit of business logic in there, and, and you were all done. Right? right. And I, and this was awesome. I mean, I use this all the time, you know, um, and I used to do talks about it and I used to tell everybody I could about it, not only because I worked on the project with Microsoft, but I, but that was really solving a big problem we have because a lot of times, and this is kind of where I'm going is, as you said, sometimes we spend a lot of time writing a test and stuff. And, and I've said this on Twitter, sometimes I spend more time writing a test. I did the actual code. Right? That's exactly it. Yeah. Yes. And, on. And, 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 and there's a problem with that. And, and that is, um, especially for, you know, the scaffolding, like uh, what IntelliTest did, we, yeah, that should be automated. And why it isn't now is beyond me. But, um, you know, uh, because that test, you know, what IntelliTest did was test encapsulation. And this is what I was talking about at the user group on Thursday was, you know, you've got to get encapsulation right if you're going to write good types and have good programs and things like that. And Microsoft's just kind of dropped the ball on that because when they moved to .NET Core, they abandoned IntelliTest, right? And there's been a bunch of us, you know, complaining for years now, is why don't you bring this back, you know? And they, you know, the last time I checked the ticket, you know, in, in, in Visual Studio, uh, it's, it's on the roadmap, but there's no, there, I have no idea what's happening with that, you know, but, right. but, but Visual Studio needs to make, I guess what I'm trying to say is again, Visual Studio needs to make things like this easier for us. We shouldn't be spending most of our time running unit tests, right? Well, you know, what's funny is that you mentioned um, that essentially typecasting at, at overups. That's actually one of the number one things I see wrong, right? So we try to figure out what's going on in the code and, mm. and maybe I should take a moment to explain what the heck I'm talking about with overops here. But uh, one of the top things that we see is uh, converting data from different data types mm -hmm. in the background fails applications. And remember that, yeah. that scenario I said earlier where I had to get on a plane and six of us were debugging this problem. It was about a conversion of a date. Mm -hmm. and these mm -hmm. things get swallowed in the background in the code and we can't figure it out. Yeah. And just a short advertisement, if you don't mind, on, on the overop side, because people think I'm nuts for going off and seeing all these things without something that can be used. What we do is we actually see code as it executes and we're able to spot the problems in the code as yeah. it's executing. So if you had a date and it's being converted in the background and you're not able to figure out, hey, well, why did this happen? We actually take the code, decompile it, 
right from .NET or even Java if you want to go off on that side. We use the CLR and the JVM to go in and see what's happening and decompile that code and show the variable and values. Mm -hmm. So that scenario where I hopped in the plane, uh, it was a, a partner company over in Austria, their API that we were calling and nobody thought to check the date coming back from them was in a European format. Don't talk to me about <laughs> universal date formats and why they weren't used. You yeah, know, we were complying yeah. with an API that we were given. Yeah. And so I actually ran, this was when I was actually running that company on my own. And I came to Overops and I literally found it in minutes. Right. And, and mm -hmm. that takes that whole side out of trying to figure it out. And even the developer that was doing it, we used to call him the little gnome in the woods. Um, <laughs> I hope he doesn't listen to this. <laughs> Sorry. Nobody um, on my show anyway. So, <laughs> so <good. laughs> but uh, but he used to go off and do this, these coding things. And then he, he decided he didn't want to work there anymore. And uh, at the partner company, and we had no idea what was going on. So what, that's yeah. what OverOps does. And, and I'd say anybody who wants to find quick ways to get back to things happening, like the number one errors we see are those typecasting issues. Mm -hmm. Null reference, null reference. Yeah. That's the number one, pretty much. That's yeah, null. I did this yeah. one POC with a company, a retail company, uh, about a year or two ago, two years ago. And they were test-driven development basis, big company. You would have all heard of them. And they're looking at the transactions and thinking, oh, we got no unknowns. We, we're perfect. You know, we have got this great <laughs> test driven development mentality going, methodology. And we go and sit down with, and I don't even want to say the name to be super uh, nice and responsible yeah. here, but we sat down with um, Mr. Smith, we'll call him, uh, <laughs> and uh, said, hey, we just ran this on your code for two weeks. Mm -hmm. One null reference uh, pointer error was actually happening 3.7 billion times. Yeah. <laughs> and he goes, oh, geez, looks at his operations guy. That's got to be costing us. <laughs> He's like, yeah, you had 15 billion errors in yeah. 14 days. Yeah. They're going through this app. And, and that's something, you know, for all the developers to think about. It may be nothing to have a null reference pointer, right? Yeah. Right. Whatever. It just doesn't have a value. We caught it in our exception, try catch, and moved on. But that actually is something that now the exception handler is taking, and it has to do some processing. Mm -hmm. All this stuff takes away from your application. Yeah, so and we spotted and this and told them all the unknown unknowns like that. Yeah, and exceptions. You know, I even talked about this Thursday at the user group meeting. Exceptions dramatically affect the performance of your application, right? And and, uh, you know, I, I've got a, a story kind of like yours, you know, not as as bad as a billion or whatever, you know, no reference exceptions you were getting. But, you know, uh, you know, uh, was it uh, eight plus years ago, I was working for this company and, um, you know, I found out. So I, I found I was seeing an issue, but it was coming from one of their DLLs they wouldn't give me the code to. Right. And so it was right around that time that I found this event that's in .NET that you can actually trap every exception in the entire application domain. Right. And not just the try catch block, you can catch any exception within the entire application domain of the program. Right. So that means you can ex you can trap exceptions from other DLLs. Right. right. Even even if they're swallowing those exceptions. It keeps percolating up. Yeah. Right. And. No, they were swallowing it. And so, oh. so I, I was seeing this issue. And then, so I got their DLL, I reverse engineered it, right? And I looked into it and every time I, I won't say what I actually was sending into it because the way I described it in, in, in conference talks, kind of like you, I have to cover up the guilty people, you know? So every, every time I sent in like an order object, right? It was causing 300 exceptions, right? And just one order caused 300 exceptions. Do you know why? It was a date time. <laughs> See, there you go. And it went proven right there. And and the funny thing was, I, I, I told them this and then they canceled my contract. Because <laughs> <laughs> they didn't like hearing how bad their code was. <laughs> oh, that's it, it, it. Those are just so common, right? Yeah, and that's yeah. luckily, and I would have loved, I wish you could have run over ops against that because we will. Yeah. Um, so-called catch the swallowed and uncaught errors. Yeah. You know, so, so I gave what, the, so we had two, let's do, I like threes. So we had the number one was the uh, typecast conversions. Yeah. Data as a reference. Null, null the reference. null reference was next. Yeah. 
the next one are the uncaught ones. These can get nasty. And I've seen yeah, this yeah. so many times. Take your, you're doing a try catch. Why? Well, the compiler probably forced you into it. Okay. You didn't swallow the exception. Great. But what happens if you didn't close either the database connection or the um, mm -hmm. uh, close the file, the reference to the file that you're, uh, you're writing it to? Um, you have a try catch and then you close it inside of the catch. Mm -hmm. Ooh, bad, 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 bad. You got to do it in the finally, right? Because right, you have right. to wrap it up. What happens if an uncaught exception happens? One thing changes that you're calling on that a new exception is being thrown that you never caught. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's probably the three biggest types that I see people doing. And, you know, and again, the advertising part for overops is that it does catch all of those. Yeah, so no. we'll actually tell you right away with the with the lines of code right down to it so you can see it, the variables and their values, um, and, and reach out. I, I'm going to be quiet now on overops, but uh, <laughs> I love this stuff is so cool. Yeah. I'd like to check it out sometime. I don't think you I don't think you guys have showed me any of this stuff yet, have you? I don't think so. We gotta get you in a trial. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> yeah, get on the line with somebody because it's it's easy to stand up. Yeah, minimal overhead. It's actually written out of uh, you know, one of the most amazing engineering groups I've seen out of Tel Aviv wrote this agent that's it's written natively. And the .NET team over there is just amazing as well as you know, profiler or agent. Um you know, in the .NET world, it's referred to as both. The one thing I say about the .NET world is I wish Microsoft, if you're listening, mm -hmm. um, be able to attach multiple profilers mm, at yeah, the same time, yeah, right? There's yeah. a bridge that Microsoft created, but they haven't thrown it out there for everybody to use. Yeah. Um, but it's it doesn't prevent anyone from, from going ahead. And, and I've actually got a customer using that bridge. Um, and uh, it's it's just amazing what you can get out of a profiler running against your application. Yeah, and and, and speaking about exceptions and unhandled exceptions and things like that is, you know, I, I, again, I, I don't talk about this much anymore because I just got tired of talking about it. But, you know, um, I do talk about it, I think, in my defensive programming um, conference session. And, and that is, you know, um, every, uh, you know, a program type in .NET, except for console app, has the ability to do global exception handling, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that that itself doesn't really have global exception handling built into it, but the different frameworks do. You know, the the WinForms has a different way of doing it. You know, ASP.NET has a different way of doing it. You know, it, each one of those have a different way of doing it, except for console apps. So, for some reason, they left it out of the console apps, and. Um, you know how many companies I've gone into that actually was taking advantage of that? Like zero. Yeah. Right. And and I and I tell people all the time, I go, you know, if you don't do this stuff, then what happens when there's an un one unhandled exception can bring your entire system down. Right. 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 Just one can bring everything down. You know. I have a brilliant idea. So after you get the cookbook, <laughs> you gotta write a book on the biggest mistakes everyone's making. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good we've idea seen, we've actually seen it in so many places I, I, yeah. why don't and it would be so amazing and even do a whole the whole show on it yeah well <laughs> you know that's fun. you know that's kind of you know the, the, the biggest section of my coding standards talk which I did Thursday is basically issues I see all the time right and and, mm -hmm. and I, I even you know I even told the audience on on Thursday that um that I'm looking over a new code base right now and I see these exact issues, right? right. <laughs> .NET's been around 20 years and I'm still seeing these same mistakes over and over and over again, you yep. know? And uh, it frustrates me as a speaker <laughs> and a writer really that, you know, it, this keeps happening, but. Um, yeah, here it's crazy. Here we are yeah. talking about it 20 years later, the same things that we talked about 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. and and. And speaking about those, I, I know, you know, Microsoft has, has changed, you know, has changed how they deal with nulls from, you know, nullable types to these, you know, not null attributes and, and things like that we have now. But there's still going to be a problem, I think, no matter what in .NET land. And, uh, and we always have to keep track of those. Oh, another thing to add to your list of uh, things I see people do wrong all the time is, oh, wait, did you say dispose issues? Was that one of the top? No, I didn't. No, I just oh. I went with top three. But yeah, we could keep going. Yeah, the, when I get a new code base, pretty much the first thing I look for is dispose issues because nobody does that right. Right. Nobody 
disposes of all their types correctly. Yep. I've yet to find a code base to do that. And and yeah. use and like I said, when I first go into a new company like now, that's exactly what I look for first. Is yep. let's before we do anything, let's just fix all the virtual memory issues first, right? And then move on from there. <laughs> Absolutely. There's yeah. there's just so many things that repeat themselves and and they just the further you go along, it, it, it gets they just pile up. The the pile keeps going higher and higher. So Yeah. And Mahesh was getting really excited about this uh, <laughs> uh, mistakes book. <laughs> I love it. We'll have to come up with an interesting name for it. You know, uh, I will go back and fix this code later. <laughs> I alone can fix it. No, okay. Oh, is it? That's actually so that so one of my if you talk swallowed exceptions, that's one of my favorite comments when I see it from customers' code. Um, Remember to come back and fix this later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where they have a comment, and then right? we go. So then we pull it down. We call these the unknown unknowns. So yeah, we yeah. go in, and nobody realizes they're going on in the background until you see it pop up in overall and you see the comments like that, and you're like, "Your developer left, didn't they?" Yeah, nope, they're yeah, still yeah. here, but they're working on something new. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're in a different team, and now we can't even talk to them anymore. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm well, guilty of it. I admit it. <laughs> I know. Um, well, we're out of time. Uh, luckily, there's no new code rules today because I just have like one or two more slides. Um, but I, I'm really glad you came on the on the show. And and if you know if you ever make it down to San Diego, make sure you let me know and and uh, we can go hang out, get some coffee or something. And uh, um, if I ever make it up there, which I try not to go up there, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot more fun. I'll go down your way. Yeah. I'll, I'll see you in the future. I, I try not to go north of San Onofre. That's kind of my my thing, you know, unless there's a concert, then I'll go. But other than that, I, I try to, to stay in San Diego. And you can't uh, I just hate no free without the the symbolism of what it is. <laughs> <laughs> no. And I'm going to leave that one as a yeah. joke between us. Everybody knows, everybody who lives here knows what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, all right. So um, the, uh, the, the, well, you've already plugged over up, so we already know what you want to plug. Uh, so what, so the last question I have for all my guests is, uh, so besides coding, uh, what do you do for fun? What do I do for fun? Yeah. Um, bike ride. I've got a, a 13 year old and a three and a half year old. Um, so that also works out for babysitting sometimes, but uh, I'm also into craft beer, trying a lot of the breweries mm -hmm. and the IPAs, hence why I love coming down there. Yeah. Um, yeah but other, I don't have much time due to the three and a half year old for sure. Oh yeah, we're three and a half old. Oh my god. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. You've been through it. I know. Yeah. Um, actually, you know the other thing I do for fun, and and when everybody finally goes to bed, I can finally pull out and see what's happening, the latest thing in the technology world. Yeah. I love just like I was in the mobile side for years, and you know I call my job my hobby, mm -hmm. and I think that's why I like doing, it. and that's why here we are on a Saturday, and this is fun. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's just. I, I've enjoyed the conversation and the, the comments from everybody here. And, you know, yeah, if anybody has any other questions, reach out. But uh, that's my yeah, life. Yeah. I'm a geek. Well, you know, uh, you have a three and a half year old. And, uh, um, you know, I just had a granddaughter start fourth grade. I just had a grandson start first grade. And then I'll have another granddaughter starting in, I don't know, three more years, I guess, uh, school. And, uh, you know, what, the one thing I, I do miss uh, – about um, having little kids is uh, just seeing the world through their eyes. Yeah. You know, just, just to see, you know, people, someone look at the world from a completely different perspective than, than, than you all ever thought possible. And uh, it, I think you kind of see things differently when you, when you go through that. Right. Absolutely. Um, there's at least even can excite them. Like yeah. just the dog, like yelping. <gasps> Yeah, yeah, just the smallest <laughs> things, you know. And e even when I'm in the grocery store, and I, I, I love seeing little toddlers and stuff skipping and jumping down the aisle because I go, man, I wish I could do that. <laughs> yeah. I'm the crazy man if I do that. <laughs> but you didn't start it early enough in life to continue doing it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, thanks a lot, and uh, I can't wait to uh, speak with your other. Uh, <laughs> Other Uber Ops uh, guide uh, uh, next week. Daryl, yeah, Daryl will be on yeah. next week from uh, Bradenton, Florida. Uh, yeah. Great history uh, when you get him and and folks. Just a, uh, you know, Daryl's got a bad, big background on the uh, monitoring side and APM mm -hmm. and 
uh, that side of things. And I'll let him talk a lot more about that, but get your questions ready. Yeah. Um, how do you take a look at your, uh, your system once it's into production? There's probably a good topic if he hasn't uh, thrown it out there yet. Yeah, maybe maybe I'll get him to get more into the uh, uh, the, the profiling part of it because that's that's something else I talk about in my conference talks is is profiling your app. And again, the reason I bring it up is because I don't see anybody doing it. You know, right. and yeah, and it's, it's to me that's kind of crazy. And even you know, I've I've told this a bunch of times where you know one contract I was working on. And we're getting close to release, and I go, well, you know, I want to spend a day or whatever, you know, profiling your app, you know, make sure we caught everything. And they go, no, we're not going to pay you for that. I'm going, oh, okay, and good luck, good luck to you. Yeah, and <laughs> right. I love when they take that and try to go away and just use the recommendation without the expertise. Yeah, but yeah. Close yeah. on that note alone. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks a lot. I'll, I'll see you next time. Thank you. Take care, everyone. All right. Well, that was a great uh, interview. I, I I say this every week that I I have fun in the show, like we were just talking about, and uh, I hope you guys have fun watching the show. Uh, I get up early sun Saturday mornings to uh, bring this to you, and uh, I hope we're doing some good. I I think we are. Um, so I, I, I'm looking. I'm <laughs> sorry. I I get a little scattered, more scattered brain than normal when I'm not feeling great. Uh, but Chris was a great guest. I can't wait to have his. Uh, uh, buddy on next week and um maybe we'll have some more uh over ops people too um so as usual as always every week um if you're watching the show you can go pick up a copy of um code rush from dev express for free just go to dev express uh, uh slash donna dave and get your very own donna dave copy of code rush code rush is the only refactoring excuse me tool i've used uh, since visual studio came out i use it every day that i'm coding and you know, it helps me to find issues and, and refactor and and just makes my life more productive. So why not get a free copy of it? And uh, if you if you download a copy, if you like it or don't like it, let me know and uh, let's talk about it. Um, so I did a Twitter poll uh, last week and I was asking, um, you know, how many saw, I only had 13 people vote, unfortunately, but you know, how many software engineers speak in person and, and don't speak in person? Uh, so at least for my poll, it looks like 76% uh, uh, speak in front of people. Um, so I'm talking to those who don't speak in front of people. Um, you know, I've talked and written and, and, and until I'm blue in the face that, you know, I, I don't think I would be the software engineer I am if I didn't force myself you know, uh, 20, 27 years ago to learn how to speak in front of people. Because at, at the time I would have done anything but that. And, uh, but I knew I needed it to do it someday. And so I forced myself into it. I founded a user group and I started speaking a couple months after the group was founded. And it's really helped my career. So if, if especially if you're a newer developer, I definitely recommend uh, learning how to talk in front of people get in front of people and speaking at user groups or conferences or, you know, it will help you out. It helps helps you uh, speak better. I don't know if I speak better, but I, I think I do. And uh, and it's always helped me to be a better software engineer. So I hope you take that advice and uh, and, and go learn how to do that. There's lots of ways of doing it, including in, in India, you can join a C-sharp corner uh, chapter. In, in America, we uh, join user groups. And so, um, yeah. Go do it. It's it's and you get to hang out with uh, people like me and and probably people better than me. So uh, here's some geek humor today. The job interview. This is this is perfect. Uh, the job interview. Uh, invert a binary tree in a whiteboard, and per, that that would be me just staring at him, going what? And then you know the job is make the button bigger. <laughs> yeah, I I have a pet peeve about a lot of the questions that are asked in job interviews and. Since I've just gone through three months of job interviews, I, I definitely I think I have some new PTSD about that. Um, so there's your geek humor for uh, uh, this week. All right. Well, thanks for watching. Uh, next week again, we have uh, Daryl Dunn from he's a solutions architect with Overops going to be on the show. So I'm looking forward to that. It'd be another great dis uh, discussion. Uh, please be safe about COVID. I talked about at the beginning of the show. Uh, you know, uh, it's becoming really bad again in, in America, unfortunately, because it's too many people here who won't get vaccinated. I don't know, I, didn't, I don't understand why. Um, 
But if you can get the vaccine, please go get the vaccine. Um, if you can't get the vaccine, uh, uh, please uh, stay safe, wear your mask, uh, listen to your medical professionals. Um, I'm still waiting to hear back to see if my grandkids have got COVID. Uh, they were exposed uh, yesterday at school. And so I'm waiting to hear back from that. So keeping my fingers crossed about that. Um, if you can't, um, if you can't, uh, uh, whatever, go donate blood at your local blood bank. Um, they're always looking, uh, they need your blood. There's, they're at a big shortage right now. And, uh, uh, hopefully whoever's knocking on my door will go away. Um, uh, so anyway, go give blood. It will make you feel like, uh, you know, it'll make you feel good about yourself and, uh, fellow, help you, you know, your fellow human and, and, uh, you know, it doesn't cost anything. So do that. Um, please, please email me um, any suggestions you might have, comments, uh, questions, whatever you want to do at rockinacodeworld at csharpcorner.com. Um, I, I don't get very many emails, so please e email me. I'll feel lonely. And with that, I, I'll talk to you next week on uh, Rockin' the Code World. Done at Dave.